Good afternoon, class. Today, I'd like to discuss the uh, contents of the Book of Job in relation to the concept of uh, theodicy. So it might be helpful to start off with the uh, concept of theodicy first. And a theodicy is a justification for an all-powerful, all-knowing, uh, uh, perfectly good, or sometimes called omnibenevolent God, given the problem of evil. And uh, it essentially runs in, in this way. The argument runs in this way. If God is all-powerful, God could uh, prevent evil. If God is all-knowing, um, God would know that evil is going to happen. And if God were perfectly good, God would want to stop evil. And yet evil continues. And so, or evil exists and continues. And so the um, theodicy is a uh, justified reason for the, re for the existence of evil given the existence of the type of God just described, the all-powerful, all-knowing, perfectly good God. It might also uh, be helpful to distinguish between uh, natural evil and moral evil. Natural evil are those uh, uh, negative, disastrous things that happen to us, um, given nature, such as earthquakes and, and tornadoes and hurricanes and, and uh all, all manners of natural disasters, whereas uh, the moral evil are the evils that uh, we commit um, um, against each other as human beings. So things like um, wars and and uh, all manners of crimes. So so the former is is a natural evil, and the latter is a uh, is a moral evil. And uh, moral evils are often justified given the uh, concept of, of free will under the, the paradigm of the divine that I just described. So uh, God is still all powerful, but God gives human beings free will. And then uh, human beings misuse the free will and this causes evil in the world. Whereas the natural evil, given the uh, sort of the, the cosmological view that God is in control of all things, we might see these natural evils and say, oh, well, uh, why, why did this occur? Right? So, so again, a theodicy is a justification for the uh, for the all-powerful, all-knowing, perfectly good uh, God, given the problem of evil. The term was coined, theodicy, the term was coined by a, a philosopher named Leibniz in 1710 in his book, Theodicy. And he gives a particular theodicy explaining that this is the best of all possible worlds. So uh, a creator God creates what is seen as the um, best of all possible worlds, and there is evil in it, but all other worlds would be, um, would be worse. And, and so given uh, th this could be one explanation um, um, for the existence of evil. Shortly thereafter, in, uh, in 1755, there was the um, Lisbon earthquake that happened on All Souls Day. And uh, this is when the theodicy, I think, was uh, mostly challenged by a, uh, a very severe negative event. Um, but this is one of many theodicies. Again, it's not just a reason for the evil, but a justification uh, for it. And there's, there's many, there's many uh, different theodicies. Um, so, so let's now talk about the book of Job, the contents of Job, the story, and, and see how this relates to the concept of the Odyssey. So in the book of Job, which is in the uh, Hebrew Bible, particularly in the writings of the Hebrew Bible. Um, so we have the law or Pentateuch, we have the prophets, and then we have the writings. And in the writings, there's a subgenre of wisdom literature in which the book of Job uh, can fall into. Uh, the book of Job is the uh, story about a man named Job um, who is uh, uh, observed by God and found uh, pleasing to God. In the beginning, the prologue, chapters 1 and 2, God is essentially boasting about, about Job. Uh, Job is obedient. Job is faithful to God. In, in the story, uh, if we just sort of list what we might call a cast of characters, we have Job, uh, we have uh, God. We have uh, Satan, um, which his name essentially just means the accuser. Um, we have Job's three friends. We have another individual uh, named uh, Elihu, and we have Job's wife. Essentially, those, those are the uh, essential characters in this story. 
So Job is, I'm sorry, God is sort of boasting to Job. And this is when um, at the beginning, Satan, the accuser, uh, sort of comes and is talking to God and, and basically says, the reason Job is obedient and faithful and doing everything right is because you give him everything that he wants. If you were to take things away from Job, uh, Job would curse you and, um, and then he wouldn't be obedient. And, and God disagrees with this. And essentially what happens is Satan and God sort of make a bet. It says, if negative circumstances befall Job, will Job curse God? And, and God bets that Job won't, and Satan bets that uh, Job will. And then God essentially grants Satan permission to uh, destroy uh, everything important to Job. And this is the first uh, um, instance in the, uh, in the book where evil enters. And, and we get an interesting explanation uh, for evil. Right? So what uh, Satan does is destroy uh, all of Job's property, uh, kills all of his children, destroys all of his livestock, and um, and Job uh, does not curse God. He he's quite upset, uh, but he he does not curse God. And so this is sort of one, round one of the uh, of the negative that happens to Job, and Satan and God meet again, and and God basically says, "Yeah, I was right. Um, Job did not uh, curse me." And Satan says, well, that's just because I didn't uh, harm his body, right? I destroyed all of his stuff, but his body is fine. If I harm his body, then he'll definitely curse you. And again, they sort of make this bet and, um, and Job. Um, and, so I, and, and God says, well, you can do anything you want. Just don't kill him, right? You can, you can uh, make him suffer, but just don't kill him. So, so this sort of round two of the evil and Satan inflicts Job's body with these terrible boils, and it says that he has to sort of break uh, pottery and scrape off the uh, the boils. And he's sort of sitting there in in uh, in uh, ashes and um, in mourning. And his wife sort of says, "Why don't you uh, curse God and die?" And and she leaves, and um, and he does not uh, curse God and die. Uh, in fact, he he. Uh, he, he uh, praises God. And, and so this is the uh, scenario that, that happens so far. This is sort of the, uh, the prologue. Uh, this, so far, this is just chapters one and two. There is, um, there is uh, 42 chapters, and this is just sort of the introduction um, to what's going on. Right? Um, so, so let's sort of review for a moment. Uh, we know uh, great evil has happened to Job. And we know it's not Job's fault. And this is something that, uh, that only we know uh, in the story that the, uh, the audience, uh, God knows, Satan knows, and Job knows. But no one else knows this, right? So um, then uh, Job's three friends um, hear what has happened to him. And they come to visit him and console him. And they just, for the first couple of days, they just sit in silence and then the next part of the book has to do with what's called the dialogues. And this goes on from chapter 3 um, to uh, chapter 31, the dialogues between Job and his, uh, his three friends. And essentially, it's quite, it's quite negative uh, because after Job has this suffering that, that he didn't cause himself, his friends essentially say, okay, Job, what did you do to cause all this suffering? And they have a very interesting concept of why evil happens. Essentially, they're, they're under the impression that uh, evil happens because you did something wrong, and uh, vice versa, good will happen if you do something good. And so it can be put into this sort of way of looking at the world. If you do good, uh, this God blesses you. If you do evil, this God curses you, right? But it, it is essentially uh, your fault or, or um, someone's fault that, that the evil um, is happening. But, but in this particular case, they, they just assume, given their worldview, that it is Job's fault. And so they encourage him uh, from chapter 3 to chapter 31, the bulk of the story of Job, they encourage him to, uh, to repent of this evil. And he continues to say that he did nothing wrong. And they continue to say, when will you uh, 
uh, stop lying to us and yourself. Just confess. Once you confess and repent, this uh, destruction, this evil that you're experiencing will, uh, will go away. And this just continues and continues. Um, and then in chapter 32 through 37, this new character enters um, a generation younger than, than, the, uh, than the other three friends of Job and Job himself. His name is Elihu. And he suggests that maybe there's an alternative explanation for this. Um, maybe um, God is still righteous somehow, but Job did not do anything wrong. And this essentially challenges this, this worldview that uh, if you do good, God blesses uh, universally, meaning always and everywhere. If you do wrong, God curses always and everywhere. And therefore, you can assume if someone's suffering, it's something they did wrong. This is something that's quite challenged in the, uh, in the book of Job uh, from the audience perspective and now from a particular character's perspective. And soon thereafter, um, God... Uh, comes down in chapter 38 and challenges Job. Uh, first, he um, rebukes Job's three friends for, for uh, uh, suggesting that Job did something wrong. And then he essentially takes Job up into sort of this whirlwind and shows him all of creation and essentially says, uh, I am God and you are just a human being. Um, and, and, um, and uh, it, it's an odd thing. God does not give Job an answer per, per se. He just sort of shows Job that God is God and that Job is a human being. And let me uh, go ahead really quickly and read one passage um, from this afterwards. Um, Job says, uh, and this has been translated in, in many different ways. Let me get an uh, earlier JPS version. So 1917, um, Job says something like, Wherefore I abhor my words. This was when he was questioning God and saying, Why does this happen? And, and sort of wishing he was born dead and, and because of all this terrible suffering. He says, Wherefore I abhor my words and repent, seeing that I am dust and ashes. And then in the 1985 version, it says, therefore I recant and relent, being but dust and ashes. Um, other translations could say something like, therefore I retract and repent of dust and ashes. Therefore I despise and repent of dust and ashes. And it's interesting because um, given how you look at it, one is Job's just um, full of regret that he questioned God, despite all the suffering. And he sees that, that he is... Um, um, not one to question God. And another would, would, would almost argue that he he regrets just being a human being and being um, subjected to all of this and wishing he could sort of have more of a say in it. And it's unclear exactly uh, which one it's saying. Uh, but, but how to relate it to theodicy? So this gives a reason, if, if we can call it that. It gives a narrative reason why evil happens, but it doesn't necessarily give a justification. And this is a, a interesting distinction. So it gives a reason. We know, narratively speaking, why did the evil happen, right? The evil happened because Job was being obedient. God was essentially bragging. Satan said, if evil happens to him, he will uh, curse you. Uh, God takes that bet and says, no, he won't. And this is why the evil happens, right? Now, one thing it does clear up, it does clear up that evil can happen to people even though they don't do anything wrong. And so it challenges another, what we might call uh, ideology or way of looking at the world. But the book of Job, um, I would argue, and, and others have too, falls into an anti-theodicy, uh, which, which isn't a theodicy. It gives a a narrative reason why the evil happened, but it doesn't give a justification for the evil. Job repents. Uh, he doesn't. Uh, he doesn't keep pressing God and saying, "Why? Why would you do something like that?" Instead, he he uh, he repents uh, for for saying what he did, and basically says, "I am just Job, a human being, and you are God, uh, God, and and who am I to?" Uh, question or complain. And, and so this does not give a uh, justification, just a reason, and therefore it's seen as uh, anti-theodicy. Um, and so these are some of the ways in which the, uh, the book of Job uh, definitely acknowledges 
the, the realness and the suffering of evil in the world, which is uh, um, one thing, one aspect of a theodicy, right? It would, it says evil is real, it's quite real, uh, but it also says, uh, says um, God is real and quite real. And so the book of Job acknowledges both the, uh, the absolute realness of God and the absolute realness of evil, but it doesn't give a justification for how both can exist in the world. It, and that's why it's anti-theodicy as opposed to a theodicy would acknowledge the realness of evil and the realness of God and then give an explanation that was a justification. Or both, and this is something that Job, the Book of Job, doesn't do. So I hope this was helpful in explaining, uh, in, in more of a just an outline form, some of the contents of the uh, of the Book of Job, as well as how it relates to uh, the Odyssey. Thank you.